So the resurrection continues its reclamation project today. From the ground of fear and amazement in front of the empty tomb with that gr driving question, will we flee or will we follow? Will we follow across all of the lines that God transcends and includes with the resurrection? Or are there lines that we still refuse to cross? Thomas and the rest of the apostles crossed a line when they reached out and touched the wounds. Last week, Peter crossed a line by healing someone on the Sabbath. And today we encounter other lines further out from Jerusalem, further out from the center. We are heading to the margins today, to the lines on the wilderness road, the wilderness Gaza road. How many lines do Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch cross? No, how many do they transcend in their encounter today? Lines of race, Possibly, although we do need to be careful not to read modern racist tropes back into history. But the fact that one of them is likely darker complected than the other is perhaps one line of demarcation, but probably not the most significant one. More significant are lines of social status and foreign allegiance and physical condition. The Ethiopian is from the court of Candace, which is a Latinized version of Kandake, which was a title held by Nubian queens from the kingdom of Kush in what is currently Sudan and Egypt. This particular Kandake was probably named Amani Tarikide, and the MFA actually has an ornate golden bracelet from her reign that you can view online. Looking at it, you can imagine the wealth that must be pouring off of this Ethiopian, the person who is in charge of the Kandake's treasury. The chariot and the scroll of Isaiah they are reading attests to the high status of this person. To quote Barbara Brown Taylor, this is someone wealthy enough to ride in a chariot, educated enough to read Greek, and devout enough to study the prophet Isaiah. These are not typically the people Jesus and his followers tended to preach to or to reach out to. And another thing that makes this foreign courtier different is that they are humble enough to know that understanding Scripture requires help. And they are hospitable enough to invite this pedestrian into the chariot. Says Barbara Brown Taylor, imagine a Washington diplomat inviting a street preacher into his late model Lexus for a little Bible study, and you get the idea. The inclusion and the transcending of boundaries in this story runs both ways. Philip is certainly transcending the lines of his own calling. Remember, he is one of the first deacons, one of the seven Greek-speaking Jewish Christians who were appointed by the Twelve Apostles to serve at table and tend the needs of the primarily Greek-speaking widows of the Christian community, but suddenly he's out on a wilderness road chasing a foreigner in a chariot. But of course, the biggest marker of difference is the fact that the Ethiopian is a eunuch, a eunuch who has been to Jerusalem worshiping at the temple, no less, which is really interesting. Is the Ethiopian Jewish? It's possible. The text doesn't say so, but 
If so, they would have not been admitted into the temple because Deuteronomy 23.2 prohibits any male with physical damage to the genitals from entering the temple. Also because eunuchs often worked for foreign queens and kings, they would have been suspect for being loyal to foreign powers. Of course, the eunuch might have also been a God-fearer, a Gentile who believed in God and followed as best they could Jewish practices. But as a Gentile, they would have only been admitted to the court of the Gentiles and not into the temple proper. So either way, in coming to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, the Ethiopian eunuch encountered many barriers. How many barriers? How many lines? As one commentator puts it, the eunuch belongs to the wrong nation, held the wrong job, and possessed the wrong physicality to be fully accepted at the temple. This is someone who is an insider at the Kandake's court, but very much an outsider in Jerusalem. And then there's the text that they are reading. Being devout enough to travel all the way to Jerusalem means that it's unlikely that the eunuch doesn't know the passages from Deuteronomy that draw clear lines around people with certain genitalia. In fact, it wouldn't be surprising at all if the eunuch had even gotten the idea that people who looked this way, who served in this way, who had these physical markers, were not at all welcome in God's court. But the text they're reading is not Deuteronomy. It's Isaiah. You know Isaiah, the prophet that Jesus loves to quote, the prophet that we love to read at Christmas time. A shoot shall grow out of the stump of Jesse. He shall not judge by what his eyes behold, nor decide by what his ears perceive. And do you know what it says right after that? It says, in that day, my Lord will apply his hand again to redeeming other parts of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, and Nubia. That's Cush. Redemption for the people of Kandake's court. And then later on, Isaiah says, as for the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who have chosen what I desire and hold fast to my covenant, I will give them in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons or daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which shall not perish. Redemption and inclusion for Nubia, and for eunuchs. So which is it, Deuteronomy or Isaiah? And this particular Isaiah passage about one who is shorn and remains silent before the shearer, can we imagine that this passage in particular might have spoken in a very resonant way to a eunuch who might know a great deal about humiliation and justice denied and wonder what that might look like in their contemporary context. So we have all of these potential boundaries, all of these lines that are drawn in the Gaza sand, and yet when the time comes, when the time is fulfilled and the question is posed, what is to prevent me from being baptized? The most faithful and really the only answer that Philip can give is nothing. 
absolutely nothing. There is nothing that prevents this. There are no roadblocks. There are no lines. There are no boundaries to God's grace. There are lines that God draws, and there are lines that we draw, and we should be careful not to confuse the two. Barbara Brown Taylor says, if God is the law maker, then God is also the law bender, or at least the law transcender who both places limits on the faithful and inspires them to challenge those limits when right relationships with God and with neighbor are at stake. The Resurrection Reclamation Project continues even to today, even as we are tasked with listening to and learning from others and being inspired to transcend all of the lines that God has transcended or that we have wrongfully imposed. As we continue to reject the fear that would cause us to flee and find the courage to follow everywhere Jesus leads. I pray that we may continue to be graced with the humility and the hospitality of both Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and to see in them what we so desperately need to see in one another, that we are one in the Spirit and that nothing, nothing separates us from each other or from God's love. Amen.